It's that time of year, folks. Uh, comings and goings concerning Miami football and probably more excitement about the possibilities of who could be coming. So we will talk about all of the above, plus what Cam saw during the spring finale. We talk Canes football with all of you for the next 60 right here at the Voice of College Football edition number 374. Cam Underwood, a state of the U, is here to make it all go for us. Hey, Cam. What is going on? Hey, what's up? Hello. Uh, just had a good laugh before we hit the record button. Uh, random facts of the world of sports that sometimes pop out of Cam Underwood's head. But, man, yeah, good to be here. Good to be with you guys on set. Ooh, not a Saturday. Lord Jesus. That's how much I want the season to get here, that I almost said Saturday. But it's Wednesday, clearly. Uh, but, yeah, man, uh, good stuff. So here we are. Let's talk. You know, especially with this transfer portal humming as it has been now for six or seven consecutive cycles, two per year for about three years now, uh, we, of course, come across names at times in which highly touted, successful high school players, much pursued and coveted across the, the, the landscape and then maybe they get lost, maybe because they just didn't fulfill expectations, others because of injuries. And then here we are a couple of years later and said player is out in front because their name is in the transfer portal. And of course, at the time of his recruitment and signing, Tervante Citizen was a big deal out of Louisiana. Huge deal, man. Um, you know, was committed to LSU for a good long time, flipped him. Um, late there in that cycle, I think that's when Brian Kelly went down there and he decided to open things up, you know, was a top 10 running back uh, nationally in that class was pushing towards top five. Like, I mean, big, fast, strong can block, run past you, run over you, catch the ball, you know, score from pretty much anywhere at, you know, six foot and a half inch and 228 pounds. I mean, it was just the total package, but unfortunately, um, you know, some of our more highly touted running backs in recent memory have befallen the same ill fate at Miami, which is a uh, a knee injury in practice as true freshman. Uh, that happened to Lorenzo Lingard. Remember him, five-star, all-world running back? Boom. And that derailed his career. I mean, he transferred to Florida and he transferred somewhere else and scored a couple touchdowns, but, like, was never the, you know – Super duper star he was supposed to be, and unfortunately, you know where he thing, landed after the University of Akron. Akron, yes, that's right, that's right. I knew it was. I was. I could see the colors. I wasn't sure if it was Akron or Toledo in my head, so I didn't want to be wrong. Uh, but I should have embraced failure. But yeah, I just thought um, that was that was you know for a guy that kicked around with Florida, Clemson was a Miami commit at one time. Then for him, Lingard to show was up, on campus. No, he got injured as a freshman here. Okay. Miami, it went Miami, Florida, Florida, Akron, Akron, never Clemson. Who am I thinking of? I thought he went. No, to that was uh, Demarcus like... Bowman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From yes. Lakeland who went to. Clemson and then it was just back. funny because one yeah. night I flipped on like a Mac game and I saw Lorenzo Lingard's playing for Akron. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> right. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that he's able to get it together and, and even have that same kind of career arc. But, you know, like the injury was so serious. I mean, Travante Citizen missed two years, guys. You know, we kept talking about bringing up, like, oh, I haven't seen him. And when I have, he's had that, like, super-duper gigantic knee brace on his knee because it was pretty catastrophic, unfortunately, for him. And, you know, had a, a bad showing in the spring game. You know, he fumbled the ball and got benched the rest of them and said, you know what? Maybe a change of scenery. Like, it's clearly, despite all best efforts and intents and desires, not working here in Miami. Um, and you know, with all these guys, again, I have no ill will to them personally. I hope that it ends up working out, but yeah, like two of the, I would say those are probably the two biggest running back, uh, recruit commits we've gotten in the last decade. And both of them injured a knee, you know, Lingard left earlier, I want to say, uh, than did Susan who was here for the two full years, but yeah, you know, really, you know, tough to see a career, you know, derailed like that because, 
you know, I was talking with a friend on the way home on the phone. Like, it's understandable for me at my big age not to be the same kind of athlete that I was when I was in high school because that was like mm, a lifetime ago for a lot of people probably even watching this that I was in high school and I was that kind of athlete. For Trevante Citizen, that has to be foundation. Like, I mean, this is like existential for him. Of like, dude, like I'm still me 700 days from when I was the one of the world's greatest athletes and like, my body won't let me do that anymore. And like, I had, you had to feel for a guy like that. You know, I said it when I came on here after, you know, Malik Young had to retire uh, medically, uh, you know, at 20 years old, I'm on Richard, same kind of a thing. Uh, but yeah, hopefully Trevante Citizen is able to uh, land somewhere and carve out himself a good career um, and, you know, get that degree and probably go pro in something other than sports, which is a definite shift from what his trajectory looked like previously. But yeah, so that's one guy off of the roster. Uh, you know, I think that Miami wanted a running back in the portal, uh, this new portal window that just opened yesterday. Um, it opened on Tuesday, not Monday, for whatever random reason. Um, but I think that that now goes from a want to a need. Um, Damian Martinez from Oregon State. Don't overcomplicate things. We got the quarterback. We got plenty of wide receivers. Hopefully we get another like ace wide receiver out there. But come on down. Be the you know, second part of the Thunder Squared running back duo with Mark Fletcher. You know, get your consistent six yards of carry. Might even go up because Miami's offensive line is great. And go from there. Uh, but that was one guy who left from the roster. Um, Logan Sagapolu, who transferred in from, I forget where. Maybe it was Oregon. Uh, but a rotational backup def uh, offensive lineman also uh, has indicated that he's going to continue his career elsewhere. Uh, and then the big one um, that I was – not because it's going to make or break this season. I was hoping that he would stay and then be in the quarterback battle for next year. Uh, but Jakari Brown, after the spring game, decided, hey, you know what? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to go somewhere else. Uh, and I think that he can, there's plenty of schools that he can go to and – fit in and play and play really well. Um, you know, he might have to drop down a little bit to a uh, group of five or, or whatnot. You know, Nicosi Perry went to FAU and did really, you know, good things, maybe something similar. Uh, I think that Jakari Brown is a power five talent. I don't know that his skill is all the way there, but again, he's, <laughs> when he gets off the bus, you're like, dude, this kid is six, four and a half, 230 pounds, got shoulders like this, can run over you, can launch the ball 70 yards. All the parts and pieces are there for success. He just needs to improve his demonstrable skill passing the ball. But if he wants to go somewhere that's going to let him run the ball a lot and scheme things open, I don't see why he can't be KJ Jefferson, you know, or something similar to that. But in Miami's case, he's off of the roster. So now you're going to solidify probably Emery as two, Poffenbarger as the three. Um, another guy who had a really tough, really tough spring game, Reese Poffenbarger. Uh, but yeah, Emery, Poffenbarger, Judd was always going to redshirt. And then you bring in Luke Nickel uh, off at least one state championship at Milton, where last year, I mean, he slayed Giants all the way to a state title in Georgia. Maybe he uh, does that again. Um, and then you have him, Judd, Emery, and Reese, or if Reese leaves, whomever else. Uh, but instead of having five in the battle, five in the room this year and next year, gets down to the real number you want to have, which is four quarterbacks in the room. Uh, again, wish him well, wish it would have worked out. Um, just needed to see him be able to pass the ball more consistently for Jakari Brown. And that never really happened. Even with steps along that path, there's still miles to go before he's really game ready uh, in that output on the field. So those are the the real big ones that have hit the portal so far. Um, you know, I don't think that Miami needs a quarterback right now. Um, definitely does need a running back, definitely does need a, a wide receiver. Uh, and there are some other guys that could, you know, find themselves maybe a little bit further down the depth chart who also, you know, make their way into the portal. Um, we'll see about that. But, you know, those are the big ones. I saw another article that had somebody's name in there who's not a scholarship player. I didn't learn it. I don't care. Like, I know all the scholarship players, guys. If I see a name that, like, I don't know, and y'all know that y'all like to pull out random names from the middle of nowhere, and when it's like, hey, tell me about this recruit, and I usually know. If somebody on the roster whose name I don't know, they're not a scholarship player. Miss me. So 
don't care. Uh, well, okay, like they're going to have a great life. They're going to do the thing. But in terms of the football team that should be competing for championships, immaterial that other person. So whatever. But that's where things stand. Uh, you know, we're going to move forward. And yeah, obviously we're going to, I, I am a, a a fan afar of all these guys who go elsewhere. I mean, that's why I watched so many SMU games. If you remember me tweeting, the, live tweeting those through last season, because there were like 10 dudes or, you know, you had, uh, you know, uh, yeah, like 10 dudes left here. We're like, cool, we're going to go back with Coach Lashley. Great. You know, so I'm, I'm going to follow these guys as they leave Miami. We'll talk about them a little bit down the road, wherever they land and whatever they end up doing. But uh, that's where things stand with the portal as of now. I'm going to ask you a question that would otherwise be a random question, but because of what you just stated, it's not. And that is, who is the last walk-on player that you remember because he actually turned out to be a player? Last walk-on. So, Jesus, number 34, Ryan Ragone was a walk-on who earned a scholarship. Nantambu Akil Fentress at safety was a walk-on who earned a scholarship. Uh... Maybe there's another person in there, but like so those are two that's extremely rare. Yeah, yeah, the, but those are two that like really popped to the front of my of my mind, of like, yeah, I was a, a walk on and then earned. But like that's, you know, that that's fantastical movie stuff. Like that rarely happens, especially like at the you know. I mean, like technically, you could be like, oh well, Jimmy Graham or Rafael Akpajori, like you know, the basketball players who like came over and like that. But like. Me, that's not in the heart of the question. You know what I mean? Like, even when he played basketball for all those years, we, everybody was like, uh, Jimmy Graham might want to make his way across campus over there to the football department. Because, like, as a six, six and a half, you know, a six, seven uh, power forward, like, yeah, he, he's probably like, yeah, six, five and three eighths or whatever, like going over to football, buddy. And he's made himself a lot of money doing that. But yeah, I would say those two dudes. I think with Fentress and Ragone. I think. I think. Yeah. He might make his way to the Hall of Fame. That being Jimmy Graham. Yeah, it's yes. it's possible, you know. So, but yeah, glad he finally decided, you know, let's uh take it back to, to high school. You know, because he's from Texas, so of course everybody plays football. Uh and yeah, he he made that move. But yeah, I would say those would be probably the ones off the top of my head. Um, that earned scholarships and ended up playing to level varying levels of success, but that's not part of the question. After 14 years, it appears as though Jimmy Graham is about done after 719 receptions and 89 touchdowns, or maybe I'm just writing him off because his last two years have been pretty sparse in regards yeah. to production. But yeah. back in the day, 99 catches, 85, 86, 85, 16 touchdowns for a tight end in the NFL. Good Lord. Pretty incredible. Falconer TRX, you're pretty incredible. We appreciate you showing up first and foremost. Thank you so much for that. The super sticker to get us off the schneid and get us going. Falconer TRX following up with... Will Miami turf factor in recruiting Jamie Martinez? Absolutely. It's the foundational issue. You know, he is a big, big turf guy. You know, we're talking about the Kentucky bluegrass. We're talking about, you know, the crabgrass around the edges. You know, we can't, can't have that because, you know, those are really weeds. But, you know, we're going to send uh, just the the foremost uh, turf scientists on the in-home visit that's going to happen and everything. It's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be a really great conversation. Hopefully, you know, he's uh, really amenable to all of the things that we say. But, yeah, turf is going to be really right at the the very tip of you know the, uh, the at the top of the conversation. Hey, good to see you. Let's tell you tell you about the turf, and that's going to be the thing that gets him to Miami. Mark my words. Thomas Hill says, "I uh, it would be great if you guys could start on time." So this is all my responsibility. Nothing on cam, but it's all my responsibility. But I do have back to back shows. Let's keep that in mind. Number one, number two, Thomas, if you want to contact me, I will refund your price of admission. Hey there. This is also, free content. <laughs> also, I was I was scatterbrained and 
venting about the secret day job for a second. So I had to get that out before Mark actually hit the go live button as well. So I will take some ownership of that, but we do the best that we can. And we appreciate you being here, bro. Falconer TRX back with this one. Love the spring game on campus. Show off the crib. It it's, is an it, intimate setting. Yeah. And it's a, it's a catch 22, man. You know, it's, it was at Cobb stadium. That's the track and field stadium right next to, uh, you know, the, the football department and like, uh, it's between the Hecht athletic center and the Mark light field baseball stadium. Like when people hit home runs over the uh, scoreboard and left field, that's where they land over at Cobb stadium. Like that's literally on the other side of the left field, you know, the scoreboard out there in left center. Um, and they brought in some extra stands and everything. Um, I was going to go, but I went out to brunch with my parents on Saturday and I had three bottles of champagne. So I decided that I was going to stay home and watch. So sorry, uh, um, which was just a better idea for everybody because three bottles of champagne is a lot of mimosas. Um, but yeah, man, it was, it's really, it's a small, I mean, like, remember I'm an alum, I've been to that place. It's really small, you know, so you can bring in 1500 stands or whatever um or you know 800 i don't think it was even a thousand that they added on top of what's there but yeah it's going to be really intimate but the thing about it is it's on campus the campus continues to have further development like my old dorm i believe is gone they're they're putting in two new freshman dorms um and i lived in my freshman dorm all five years because it was literal steps away from the school of music and i have the rest of my life to live off campus like i do now you know what i mean um but yeah, that that's getting uh, developed. You know, there's supposed to be this new football operations center on that athletic side of campus. You know, they keep, they do little updates to like Mark Light and to the you know all these different things. So you're seeing a lot that's right there, like right off the corner of San Amaro Drive uh, and everything. So in Ponce de Leon, that's the intersection. So that's a it's great to see. And then you can also just have you know ESPN cameras be like, yo, wander around a little bit. Go see the uh, the Shalala Student Center. Go look at the you know the pool deck. Go over to the old UC. Go over to the School of Music that has that new beautiful music library that broke ground my freaking senior year that I never got to like have. But it's like it's the one that has like the half wall of glass on the south end of the lake overlooking. It's gorgeous modern architecture. So go around and see that. That uh, you know like even just tell the cameraman you know turn the camera off and you know go look at the um human scenery if you will on campus as well uh, and everything and you're able to bring the biggest thing with that is you can host an incredible recruiting event you know as opposed to having the game at Traz Powell where okay cool you're gonna have students there or you know recruits there but you cannot host them in the same way if it's off campus or if you go to Orlando for a spring game or things like that so it is or even I mean, you can do a version of a thing at Hard Rock. It's not the same, though. Um, and that's the real big benefit, I think, is being able to have a really great recruiting event experience akin to Paradise Camp or Legends Camp or whatever they call it now. You know, I remember years ago, and I looked it up, like the 2014 and 15 Paradise Camps had more talent than like Nike's The Opening. You know, when you see all these guys on Sunday, Alex Leatherwood, Jerry Judy, uh, Hazelwood, like da, 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 all the, they were all there together at the same time on the same day. That's the kind of event that you can have when you do it on campus. Is it restrictive? Yes, because you're really going to have personally invited people, high dollar donor, you know, people and like families of players and families of recruits. Or if you're somebody like me who can get a credential, yeah, but like I said, I had three bottles of champagne, eh, tough. But outside of that, Joe Schmo, is, who's a Miami Hurricane fan or alum who lives in Bradenton, they're not driving down across Alligator Alley and getting into that game, you know? So it's just like where you want to have that connection to the team, you're not necessarily able to for everybody. Um, so that is the downside. But I think that, look, it showed really well on television they all reports are that they had such a great experience in, in running that as a recruiting event that though I would love to have a larger Canes Fest spring game, hard rock stadium da, 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 event, I see the value of having it on campus, even with the negative parts of it uh, that I already detailed. So typically I take in 
as many spring football games as is humanly possible. Uh, maybe I'm stretching that just slightly. Maybe it's not humanly possible, but I'm watching even down to the likes of Purdue and whomever. However, I just moved into a new place. I've yet to make a decision on, am I going to get YouTube TV or cable or this or that? And I've not really thought it that necessary to make and rush that decision and figure that out just to watch spring football games that you can see on YouTube like three hours later and see whatever you need to see. So that being said, I didn't see any of the Miami spring game. So I jumped around to several sites to gather some information and see what happened. The overriding theme that I came away with from various sources was that the secondary looked a bit ragged. Yeah, and that's fair. Absolutely. I mean, Cam Ward doesn't go 19 for 24 for 335 and three tutties otherwise, you know. And I know that he's really good, but like, yeah, there's also, I mean, spring games, exhibitions such as these are, are, are tilted towards the offense. And I think that we saw that. And, you know, reading all the reports and listening to all the podcasts, you know, of everyone creating content out there, the real spring game was the week before. Like, that's the one where, you know, closed doors, hey, we're going to let it rip. And then you, you pare it down because, look, everything's on TV. Every school has a staffer who goes through and says, hey, watch, you know, watch and chart every game from all these teams in case they do something or show something that's new and different, right? I don't know if you all remember, but I remember when Miami hired Dan Enos. You remember the, where the fuck is Dan story from, uh, uh, saving it at uh, Alabama, entirely true, by the way. Um, I went to that, and that was the year that there were two events. There was one at Traz Powell, and then a week later, there was one in Orlando. Did not go to the one in Orlando because, like, why? But I remember being at Traz Powell Stadium, sitting with a bunch of Hurricanes fans, you know, at that, you know, the mecca of high school football in Miami Dade County. And before the first play, Miami shifted from whatever formation they were in. And they just shifted skill players. And people started applauding. Because if you don't remember, one of the big things of the, the offense prior to that was line up, set, and go. There was no deception. There was no movement. There was no nothing. And before the first play, I remember, I, geez, it was, uh, it was Brevin Jordan and Will Mallory. And then they they moved and like the receivers switched who was on and off to balance with whatever. And like, they went from uh, under center to shotgun and the, the running back like stepped aside. So you saw like six guys move at the same time and people started clapping, right? Literally. But now imagine, and I think that that one was actually on television, but imagine that that's now foundational to what Miami would have done on offense. I don't know if you remember, but I remember growing up in Michigan and I would watch the, you know, the few Florida State games that were on because they're a national brand. So I would see Miami and Florida State and I would see Florida and Florida State. Right. And I would remember when they had Charlie Ward in them and Warwick Dunn and all those guys that Bobby Bowden would shift from eye to gun and gun to eye frequently, like line up, set set. And then they would shift, right? But that was like a thing that they did. If Miami were to like do that this year and be like, cool, well, this is our new thing, whatever it is, it would be on TV. It would be on film from this one. So every, so this leads me back to my original point. Every single team, every single organization, every single athletic department, football program has somebody who's going to watch and write all these things down, which is why you go super vanilla in the spring. You show them what, I mean, your staples, because everyone knows your staples, you know what I mean? But not the specials. And I think that uh, that was part of, like, this scenario as well. Um, I don't know that, you know, it should be a staple of the defensive performance, that the the, the defensive secondary uh, is as lackluster as we saw on Saturday. Um, maybe infusion of talent would help that, and maybe um, just another few months of development. Uh, but that was part of things. Um, and that should also make you a little bit excited for this offense because Cam Ward is arguably the best returning quarterback in the country, guys. Like, he's the goods. And I think that with him on this roster, uh, 
Miami is about to go shopping in the portal. Like we are really looking for gourmet ingredients, like top of the list shopping. Um, I saw somebody in the chat, uh, you know, do you think that Miami is going after a receiver? Absolutely. Do I know who? No. But I think, <clears throat> you know, we'll see as the portal develops in this next little bit. Yes, I do think that Miami is going to go after a top tier receiver. Uh, I already mentioned Damian Martinez and, you know, maybe others uh, as top tier running backs. But like we're looking for game changers now. We're looking at the top of the roster, the best guys that we can get from wherever we can get them. That's what it is. I tweeted it before, and I've said it in here before. Guys, this is an all-in season. Whatever it takes, chips go to the middle and let everything go where it is, right? Like, like let the results be what they may. But on Miami's side of things, they have to do everything they can to get all of the talent that they can right now, this is a go for it season, even absent what happened to Florida State, right? Because they went all in last year and then they had some major catastrophic injuries, including their quarterback or two, and then didn't get to the playoff. We all know that all that stuff that the, the fact that they had these catastrophic injuries and that kept them from the playoff that cannot dissuade you from also going for it. The scenario and situation is such that you have to push. And I think Miami's going to. Chuck C., thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your contribution, sir. And then we also have Michael Davis chiming in with, of course, we read all super chats, 4th and 14, 45, 3, 27, 20. Those are things that happened. True. Yes, we could all be know. writing comments back and forth uh, yeah. on both sides of the series, claiming various scores and statistics. Right. And I mean, like, look, again, y'all have beaten us three in a row, including last year when, you know, I. If Tyler Van Dyke didn't just whatever could have would have and should have but we didn't win that game right yeah, okay good cool. game it was um i think it was more of a close game than a good game but yeah still yeah yeah um sure but like yeah look y'all went for it had some unfortunate injuries and i never root for anybody's injuries and i did not celebrate those injuries when they happened and you can go look around where i was even you know, shaming people for, for, you know, being excited. The 13 got hurt. I'm not going to say that, you know, but <clears throat> my point with that is Michael, y'all went for it and didn't get where you wanted, even with an undefeated season that cannot dissuade. Like that's immaterial to Miami. We have to go all in this Canes collective. That's now sponsoring all these sites and all these shows and all these things. They want their name out there all the time. Hey, spend the money guys. You know what I mean? And I know that there was a conversation relative to a couple of players uh, in last recruiting class was like, oh, I don't know if we want to spend money here and money there. You want to compete with the big boys, you're going to be spending a bunch of money. And I think that now going to the transfer portal, yeah, you're going to be spending money. Kane's Collective, talking to you. So, you know, put the money where, where you are purportedly putting your mouth. That's what it's going to have to be. As the two fan bases go back and forth, I would also have to say, though, that this is inconsequential. Mario Cristobal is 12 and 13. Mike Norvell was 3 and 6, 5 and 7. 8 and uh, 13. Does it, does that, <laughs> that's not Florida State football. That's not Miami football. They were both lousy their first two years. They, yeah. they were, they're both in the pro Mario Cristobal is in the process of building something at Miami. Mike Norvell has built something to a certain extent at Florida state. We'll see if it's lasting. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that to me is inconsequential comparing two lousy records from the first two seasons of each coach's tenure. Yeah. How the mighty have fallen where it's not, yeah, we won a championship in 99. Yeah. We had the best team ever in Oh one. No. Our new coach, his first two years were less terrible than yours. Like, guys, come on now. Knox Kane's here. Knox Kane 94. Good to see you. 
not having your top three defensive players rushing the passer and not being able to hit the quarterback will make any defensive backs look bad. That's a fair point. So, yeah, I could maybe dial that back. I mean, that that's true. Quarterbacks aren't live. Ruben Bain played a handful of snaps. Why waste him in a spring game and something like that, you know? And, yeah, you know, like Kiko Mawinoa wasn't out there. Uh, things. Yeah, no, that's Aki Mesador as well. So if you want to say top three player, you know what? That's a fair take, Knox Kane 94. But I still would like one proven defensive back right now in the portal, maybe two. Regardless of even dialing back some of my harsh criticism, I think that's how you optimize a roster, but we'll see. As it stands currently, I don't know if that guy exists in the portal, but we're only on day two. And I will say, based on my observation, and we've gone live uh, every day, meaning Tuesday and Wednesday, we will continue throughout the week, 3 p.m. Eastern folks on the national channel, and we just basically run through all the portal news of the day, and we bring on whatever contributors can make it to discuss their respective teams. But it was my observation today that out of the dozens and dozens of players that at least we ran through the last two days, I would say five to six of them were obvious choices of the player, like the caliber of player that you knew that they weren't kicked out of the door. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the latest is TCU defensive tackle. He was freshman All-American two years ago. He was uh, all big 12 this past year. They obviously didn't kick him out the door. He's looking for another opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the Louisville running back from Toledo who led the Mac in rushing was a top 10 rusher in the nation. Panay Boone. Yeah, that guy's doing whatever he wants. He's, he's looking for another opportunity. I mean, hey, but also like Donald Cheney Jr., who's up there in Louisville making other guys leave. You know what I mean? Cam can't see the light. What? Mr. HD said that. What light am I not seeing? Is there a freshman pass rusher you can see making the same impact as Ruben Bain last year from Anthony Manzano? No. Honestly, um, I don't know that the snaps are going to be there. I think the Marquise Lightfoot has a tremendous potential, but also he needs to gain maybe 15 pounds. Whereas Ruben Bain, uh, you know, was very much game ready. Uh, and, you know, still could be somebody who, you know, if not full time, but at least rotationally kicks inside because he's a little short for an edge and stockly muscularly built. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, yeah. In that same vein of our current conversation, Falconer X kicking in with this one. Cam, if you could bring back any previous Miami defensive back, who would it be? I mean, I know people are, are thinking that I want to say Sean Taylor, and he's definitely on the list. Um, Ed Reed was even more accomplished at this level. Um, so if you want to go interior, I say it's one of them. Honestly, flip a coin. Can't go wrong either way. I think that we need a corner more on this team specifically. So I would look at... Maybe a Ryan McNeil who played in the league for a long time, including for your Detroit Lions, uh, was a, a great corner. Maybe an Antro Roll, um, who was a great corner before he bulked up and moved inside. Um, I know that there's more that I'm forgetting. I mean, shoot, he's an analyst in the building right now. Mike Rumpf was a first round NFL draft pick. You know, um, I would say somebody like that. Um, I would lean more towards the corner um, than the safety, but I just gave you five names and I would take any of them. Like if you were to transport them from the past onto this roster, now I would take any of those five. 
and probably more, but those are the five off the top of my brain. So please don't, I know the comments are going to say, but what about, but what about, but what about, but what about, okay, you can say that. But if you yeah, want to keep kidding. it even more like super duper duper recent, you know who would be a real big ad on this team next year? Tyreek Stevenson. Second round draft pick. Like, I don't know if they do all rookie in the NFL, but I think if they do, he had to have been on that team. Like, I mean, I hate that he's playing for the Bears and doing all that stuff, but like, you know, that he would be a real big ad to put him over there at, on one side or against a specific guy traveling all game and just, you know, set it and forget it. You know, so and plenty of options. And I gave you six. So pick whichever one of those or whichever other you like. Absolutely. Let's move it on to our next uh, super chat. Thank you so much, Paulo. Who would be the ideal wide receiver transfer portal target? Um, Somebody really good. You know, whether it was like a, an Evan Stewart type player, you know, like I want somebody who can, who is incredibly athletic and also good. Um, yeah. Like just the best player and athlete that you can get because I think that we need to continue to increase the level of athleticism on this roster, especially at skill. Uh, and then just the, the best player that you can get. I mean, there have been dudes in previous years, um, you know, that Miami has missed on, unfortunately, but, you know, even if you're looking at a guy like a, uh, like a juice Wells, when he transferred up, like that would have been great. Like a Tez Walker, you know, um, who really didn't do much except for having 547 yards against Miami last year. Um, you know, but like, yeah, somebody who's a great athlete and also a good player. Um, and yeah, we are early on in the process right now. So we do need to see who else goes in. Um, but if I were to like build a player or build a portal prospect, somebody who runs four or five or under probably six two. I need them to have some size to them. So like 6'2 plus, 200 pounds plus, um, preferably from a big school. So we know that they have had quality coaching. Um, would love someone who had an all-conference or two or, you know, borderline All-American, even if it was like a third team or fourth team, you know, Playboy All-American or whatever. I don't even know if they still do those, even though they used to. Um you know, like with, you know, two years of eligibility, potentially could go to the league right away after this year with a strong year. Um, yeah, someone with that kind of build would be splendiferous. Going to, well... Yes, the same side of the ball. I thought we were going defense here with Falcon or Axe. Back to the wide receiver position. Miami needs deep threat, tall, and fast playmaker. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even if you want to look back in the, you know, Miami Hurricanes past, if you want to say, like, I had a a Yatil Green type, um, a Lamar Thomas type. Oh, my God. Give me a Lamar Thomas. 6'3", 195 pounds from Texas and run sub 4'4", and make play. If that player exists in the portal, yes. If you want to say, you know what? I like mine a little bit more muscular and also who will throw hands and beat the bedevil out of guys like Cortman Lefittingen. If you want to have somebody in the mold of an Andre Johnson, I'm good. 6'1", 6'2", 210 pounds. You know, with, you know, 4-3 speed and, yeah, you know, like, so we can even look at archetypes of, of Miami Hurricanes past and say, yeah, someone like that. I mean, hell, what I wouldn't give for uh, Amon Richards right now, man. 
you know, and that's no slight to him. Amon Richards was that dude until he had to retire. But go back and look, jumping over people at Notre Dame as a freshman, you know, that bowl game in Orlando. I remember just because they they had the cornerback playing with his heels at 10 and bailing from Amon every single play. And I was screaming there next to my boy Lou. And I said, just throw him a now screen. And that hut hut. Boom. And throw just throw him the now. Throw him the ball and let him cook. And then they hit him on that drag underneath. What happened? Barrios gets in front. He goes and scores. Things start rolling. Da -da -da. I'm almost that dude. I would, you know, but if you look and say, okay, well, those are four different guys with four different like kind of body types, but it kind of shows you like I need a guy. Like a a, a guy that it's not even about the play. He's a people. Like him being on the roster is its own play because it's about the guy, not about the scheme. Fourth in the ball game, throw it to him. But it, throw it to him. It is Michael Jordan in 1986 against the Cavs when they were drawing up a play for I God I forget the guy's name, but nobody knows his name. Um, and he just. Give me the fucking ball. I just walked out of the huddle and Doug Collins, ah, ah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, he that's when he did the dance and everything, got away from Craig Elo. Yeah, the yeah, yeah that one. Yeah. The, where he could, they, yeah, they were finally, drawing up the play. How am I forgetting this? They drew up the play for somebody else? They were Doug, Doug Collins, Collins was did? drawing. I, multiple people have said this, multiple guys who were on that team. He was drawing a play up for God, it wasn't Scott Tolzien, but it was something like that. Um, but it was like his name, it rhymes with that. God, I almost had it, but he was drawing up a play for this other guy and everybody's sitting there and Michael's just like, Man, give me the fucking ball. It just goes and the, you know, Doug Collins is like, yeah, sure. Cool. Whatever. And that's why it took him so long to get open because everybody in the gym knew the ball's going to Michael. And so Craig Elo's doing everything. You have like a Larry Nance or a Brad Doherty who's cheating over that way. Everything it was mm, whatever. Give me the ball because I am the play. It doesn't matter what you draw. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. Give me the ball. I need a receiver like that. I need a playmaker. I need a Lamar Thomas, a Teal Green, an Andre Johnson, an Amon Richards. Right? And the list goes on and on, especially if you want to talk about players from other teams. Right? Hell, I would prefer he not be this small, but if he's as fast as Santana Moss, give me that. You know what I mean? But I need somebody who it is. I am given where it becomes about the guy, not about the scheme. That's the kind of receiver that I need. I've got an article here, and if I could sift through it, I'm going to find that name. Uh, because I will know it as well, because that's when I knew the NBA. Uh, and I can't think of who that would be. Oh my goodness, this, this article goes in all sorts of different directions, but it should give the name because that's what it's about, this article. Anyway, I'll find it because I'd like to know that name too. The other thing that I wanted to know, because when these things are stated, it drives me crazy. And when you said about an all-rookie team in the NFL and Tyreek Stevenson, I verify with two different sources, he actually did not earn first team i don't know if they go past first team uh all rookie in the nfl at cornerback that went to oh. Devin witherspoon out of illinois and joey porter huh. daryl porter okay yeah those were the two that, yeah. that received it um this also reminds me this is completely off topic but my son sent me a game a couple of weeks ago that I could get addicted to, but fortunately I've been disciplined enough. They give you a, they, they also have an NBA version, NFL version, but I've been stuck on the major league baseball version where they give you a grid of nine, like a Brady bunch grid. Have you seen this? Yeah. Where you have to find a player who played for both with the lowest. Yeah. Played uh, for both or, or had a career 300 batting average plus yeah. played second base, yeah. all of that. And if you're a big baseball fan, it's not difficult, not too difficult to get a perfect, unless you got a brain like mine, which knew every statistic known to, to mankind like 20 years ago and cannot believe who I can't remember 
now because I've been so removed from it uh, that I'm like, oh, my word, I can't remember who was in the rotation for the Devil Rays in 2000. And then if I look at it, I'm like, I know all those guys. But right. anyway, James Shields and Scott Casimir, et cetera. Anyway, uh, but the the other trick to it to get a really excellent score is you try to come up with the answer that is the most obscure answer because it mm. gives you a percentage of how many people guess that. So if you had like the Red Sox and the Blue Jays, you wouldn't want to put Roger Clemens. Of course, you want to get a perfect score, so you could, but he's going to be the first one people are going to think of, okay, they played for both the Red Sox and the Blue Jays, oh, Roger Clemens. But you, want to, you want to come up with somebody obscure. So it's, it's just a fun game. And uh, what's that have to do with this? Well, just basketball and, and NFL trivia, I guess. All right. So we also have uh, Falconer X chiming in with uh, love, Lamar Thomas. He has podcast Get Him On. Nice. We can we can always um, attempt. I looked it up. I got the year wrong. It was 1988 that that was yeah. the shot. And the player that he was drawing the play up for was 10-year veteran out of DePaul, number 40 in your program, Dave Corzine. Dave Corzine. Which is why I said Scott Tolzien. See, when I knew it was, yeah. But yes, that was, the as the story goes from multiple people, he was drawing a play up for Dave, uh, Doug Collins, the coach at the mm -hmm. time, drawing a play up for Dave Corzine. And Mike went and cussed at everybody and said, give me the fucking ball. And that was what preceded the shot on Elo to send them home in the playoffs in 88. I'm going to make the obvious statement, but this is Doug Collins overthinking things because he was a brilliant tactician. Yeah. Right, exactly. Former uh, number one overall pick, wasn't he? When he played? Yeah, with the Sixers. Yeah. I believe. Like, uh, Dave Corzine was not, from my recollection, uh, like a playmaker. He was like he was a, like a spot-up shooter. Dave Corzine? Mm. Yeah. Called him the, the Lumberjack, 6'11", 250 pounds. Yeah. He was um, like the, the first version of... Bill Wennington, Bill mm. Cartwright. Cartwright was on that team as well. But yeah, he yeah. played 81 games that year, started seven, uh, was a six point a game scorer. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go look up the uh, the box score to see what he had that day. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How things could have been different if uh, Doug would have gotten his way that day. That's uh, And then, of course, Phil Jackson, less than a decade later was calling up a play for Tony Kukoc instead of Scotty Pippen, which of course is not nearly as egregious, but mm -hmm. by any stretch because Kukoc turned out to be a tremendous player, but it did not serve the seniority and the star mm -hmm. ranking on that team. Well, yeah. And remember uh, Scotty Pippen set out the rest of that game, uh, that final play and Kukoc hit that shot from like 35 with the defender in his face. So mm. But anyways, back to football. Ku coach, of course, uh, at some point earned Jordan's respect. I've heard him talk about it. They knocked him around pretty, pretty <laughs> the Olympics a, yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. when he first got there. They weren't real happy, you know. This this guy coming Fair. in, Paulo. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for that. Oh, I was going to serve this one up at some point. Thank you for the reminder because I think I would have missed it uh, because we started talking about guys like Dave Corzine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you see Miami kicking the tires on one at Cormani McLean? No, 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 no. Um, Cormani loves, uh, reportedly, 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 um, or, or according to uh, people I've spoken to, he loves um, recreational items a little bit too much. Uh, and he was unfavorably from a behavior standpoint compared to uh, a couple of players from the past whose names I'm not going to say, but none of those were things that engendered any kind of uh, warm feelings over here. So having heard all of that, that he's uh, very focused on his recreation and also not necessarily a great citizen in the community and, and school and program uh no i'm good his chance was when mario went to his house and he let 
Cormani put on the the slipper, the loafer, or whatever, you know, and everything. And then, look, we all knew what time it was when Cormani Mama came on the timeline talking about my son not signing today. Da 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 da. da, da deal with it. Schmoove, cool, good, great, wonderful, and glorious. Vaya con Dios. Do what you're gonna do, and you're gonna do it somewhere else. Uh, uh-uh. no, 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 no. You cannot try to build a positive organization and bring in someone who, even if I will admit some of what I've heard has been hearsay, right? Um, but even if half or a quarter of that is actually what the situation is, you cannot have that. You cannot have that. You cannot have that. So um, I say no and live with him going wherever he wants to go to do whatever he wants to do. Um, but no, 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 absolutely not. Well, to back that up, Deion Sanders was asked roughly eight or nine games into last season, why is Cormani McLean not playing? And Deion Sanders plainly said, uh, not showing up at meetings. When he does show up, he's late. We track film study. They've got some kind of tracker where they can gauge how much film you're watching. In. He's not watching film. He's not prepared. He's not prepared to play the game. All right. So why is Cormani not playing? Ask Cormani. That's him with his lack of doing what needs done. Um, and yeah, you know, it just, no, I, no, 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 no. Whatever happened, Cam, to a similarly troubled, maybe in a different way, but troubled linebacker from about three to four years ago who everybody was out of their mind to go get, and I believe I cannot come up with his full name, but I believe his nickname was T2 Terrell. Terrence Lewis. Terrence Lewis. Yeah. Terrence Lewis, uh, he went to Maryland, and then I'm not even sure. Uh, Terrence Lewis. You're saying UCF? Uh, that looks like him, yeah. It said UCF uh, when I just Googled it um, and everything, so... He transferred there on January 2nd of 22. He entered the transfer portal in December of 22. And I don't know that he landed anywhere from then. So, um, yeah, Maryland, uh, people uh, who've landed elsewhere. Somebody went there. Somebody went there. Somebody went there. Sorry, I'm doing really bad podcasting of, like, reading an article live on air, but you'll deal with it. Um... Wow, they had lots of good players. Like Chop Robinson was there. Terrence Lewis, former five-star linebacker. Terrence Lewis ranks fourth-rate recruit in Maryland history. Never played for the Terps in 21 due to a torn ACL. Transferred to UCF after the season. Had one solo tackle before transferring to the JUCO level. In two games at the time of the writing of this article in 2023, he had played in two games and recorded zero stats. So maybe he's out there to land somewhere else coming back from Garden City, JUCO. Um, but yeah, that's, and so far as I can tell the path and story of T2 and what a memory on the nickname, but yeah, that was, that was him. And we said, uh, and I, okay, I see people in the chat saying it, I wasn't looking over there, but you are correct. Um, but remember at the time, and you guys can go back and watch the videos. I said then that Wesley Besaint the younger four-star linebacker was the better linebacker at Miami Central that year, even with Terrence Lewis, the five-star. I said it right here. You can go back. I don't know what episodes those were. Go back and look, because your boy was right then, which is me telling you that you should listen to me, because I got the receipts on so many times I'm right. And I will also admit it when I'm wrong. But then, I was absolutely right. I did remember the nickname, because I started the questioning. Anyway, uh, this comes to mind as well. Now that uh, Takari Brown is in the transfer portal, there are two decent, what I would consider to be backup quarterbacks at the Power 5 level. They might be looking for something different at a G5 type of classification, but the UCF backup quarterback 
uh, Timmy McLean thrown for about a thousand yards last year, throw, uh, through for 14 touchdowns in his career. And then you also have Utah state's, uh, starting quarterback, Cooper Legas, who threw for 19 touchdowns last year. Obviously they're not pushing cam Ward. That's not the consideration. It's do you go get a guy that's, uh, you know, performed, uh, fairly well to be a backup. I don't think so. Um, you know, I think obviously we would like to redshirt Emory if possible, but I I don't think so. Uh, and especially, you know, you got the 85 scholarship limit and everything. Um, yeah, you really don't want to necessarily carry five quarterbacks if you don't have to. And I think that you're in a good place with three quarterbacks who will be returning next year or who have eligibility to return. And then – Luke Nickel coming in from high school. And then if someone were to leave, you can go get a transfer to backfill for that, that fourth slot. But I don't necessarily see it as a, a need unless the NCAA says you can go over the, um, the 85, but yeah, I don't see it. Falconer TRX. Thank you so much for this one. Youth is wasted on the young God given talents wasted without wisdom. Hey man, that is youth being wasted on the young. I didn't understand it when I was young, but yeah, yeah, true. Also, I'm looking up the Garden City Community College uh, roster on this other tab. Terrence Lewis played in three games, but dude, this team is stacked. The De, uh, Demond Demas, who went to uh, Texas A&M and was doing all those backflips, Jacory Hammett, you, you you know, listen to this. Kid from Miami Northwestern a few classes ago, Keyshawn Washington, former Miami Hurricane, Cameron Laybourne, uh, the brother of Colin Laybourne, who went to Florida State, Terrence Lewis, Fred Davis, uh, Keon Brown from Rickards, uh, Jalen Daniels from Tallahassee Lincoln. He was a quarterback, uh, down there for a while. Um, Jordan Miles is from down here. Like, there, this team had more talent than a little bit. My goodness, wow. That must be the Jalen Daniels, who then went to Kansas, and became the starting quarterback. No, I mean, I would, this is last year's, oh, like twenty three roster. And it's the same name. Yeah, hmm. that spelled differently, but yeah. All right, Cam. Good show. What uh, is going on at uh, State of the U? Man, we got a bunch of good stuff going on. There's a. Uh... A uh, stream of content, Justin Dottavio's cooking up. Uh, really excited for y'all to see that. I've been uh, poking into the 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 drafts in the editorial uh, and everything to look at that. Uh, you know, spring recap. Uh, you know, a couple other things up there um, and whatnot. So, um, I would say some baseball stuff, but like uh, my Hurricanes baseball doesn't look great this year, guys. Um, but yeah, you know, we're always over there, uh, 24, seven, 365. Please come fan with us. The state of the U, uh, got plenty of great stuff, more great stuff coming and you will just have to click over there to see it. So, uh, as always like subscribe, appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate you, uh, you know, interacting in the comments and, and super chats and everything. And Mark, man, it's always good to see you, brother. Thank you, Cam. I'm going to do a bit of a quick sales pitch. So if you want to duck out, it's going to take me about 20 or 30 seconds, but that's up to you. <laughs> see you next week, guys. We'll see you. Uh, the Amazon link's in the description section of all the videos. And so basically, here's the deal. I was shopping on Amazon the other day. I had already put four or five items in the cart. I'm proving a point here of how transparent the Amazon link is that you use uh, from the description section of all the videos. I got four or five items in the cart. I think, Mark, you forgot to use the Amazon link that helps the voice of college football. I grabbed that Amazon link. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to refine all these items. I'm going to have to load up the cart again. No, it's completely transparent. Just switch the cart. You're on your way. The point is, is that you are not going to screw up anything that you do with Amazon if you use our link. It's still going to recognize your account and still recognize who you are and give you whatever credit you have as an Amazon member and shopper. So please use the Amazon link in the description section of all the videos, including this one. It is transparent to you. Doesn't cost you a penny. Think of this. If you spend, let's just throw out a number, a hundred bucks at Amazon, you're sending a hundred dollars to Amazon. 
If you use our link, you're sending us three or four bucks. How about that to help support the voice of college football? So we do appreciate it. Use the Amazon link in the description section and put it somewhere where you will remember it. We appreciate it. See you next Wednesday right here on Kane's Live.